Can you smell pure water lately? Oh, me too. I've got a lemon seltzer. I got the. Uh, I have beer. <laughs> I have the polar <laughs> black cherry. Nice. Beer is always good, though. It's seven o'clock here. I'm drinking. Nice. <laughs> when it comes to beer, I can't do. Uh, I used to. I used to brew my own, so I loved mm-hmm. IPAs. And we try to half, and we do all these. Me and my brother would do all these different. We even did a Duval knockoff, and I can't do them anymore, though, man. The beer just gives me indigestion. I get really full. So now I got to stick with lagers and pilsners if, if I am going to have a beer. Yeah. Huh. I mean, a that, good pilsner, I, I enjoy a good pilsner. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. You can get really good ones. But so I'm in Seattle, and there's tons of microbreweries. I mean, you can, you mm-hmm. can throw a rock in a neighborhood and you're hitting a microbrewery. But they all do IPAs. That's, you know. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Finally, someone else is like, I'm like, I go to the, like, <laughs> the microbrewery corner or whatever of a grocery store. Yeah. And it's just like hundreds of IPAs. And I'm like, guys. Yep. There yes. are other beers. Yep. Right? yep. I was I was just saying, uh, there's a new brewery that opened up in my neighborhood. And I was just saying, like, God, I can't wait till we can travel and McLeod can come back to New York because they have a really good Pilsner. Oh, nice. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I kind of feel like I go to uh, Whole Foods or Whole Paycheck, depending on how you yeah. want to call it. And I look in their beer aisle, and it's just IPA after IPA after IPA. And it's like, you guys should be categorizing these things so it's easy to find the Pilsner and the lager, you know, because they're there. You just have to look really, really, really well. You know you know what's a really great beer? Huh. Braxton. Braxton? <laughs> Who sponsored our film. and. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> provided the beer that Jack drinks and the first t-shirt that Jack wears so if, and hosted our rep party. We're going to put this in the episode and make sure everybody goes out there. Yeah. Your local store. You don't have Braxton beer. Sadly, Tell it's them. only available yeah. in like Kentucky, Ohio, I think Indiana and maybe Tennessee now. So it's a very regional thing because it yeah. started in Covington, Kentucky. But if you're able to get a Braxton beer, they are fantastic. I never thought about this. I should put them in touch with my brother. Oh, yeah. He's all about taking local companies and helping them like, grow big. Grow. Yeah. Can you help us grow our podcast a little bit bigger? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he's really familiar with the entertainment sphere, unfortunately. That's, 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 I, got, I got that one. Uh, <laughs> So everybody that just joined us, well, actually you didn't just join us. You heard this whole lead up here. <laughs> this is all <laughs> gold. <laughs> <laughs> Usually we have a whole thing. I cut it loose, but I want to leave the whole Braxton thing in because I loved it. <laughs> Adam Stovall, McLeod Andrews, you guys just made an incredible movie. People will know McLeod has come on, come on Spoiler Country before. He is the narrator, I guess, voiceover narrator. Not to ever- I think we decided narrator. I think we did decide narrative. We had a whole discussion about it. Yeah. We decided that typically voiceover refers to commercials, animation, uh, voice replacement. But that's right. That's right. Narrator, that's right. Uh, One of my favorite books series of all time, which is the Sam and Slim series by Richard Cadry. If you haven't read it, um, don't read it. Just download the audio books. You can hear McLeod because he's amazing. Ah. Read along. Actually, get the book and read along with him. That would be a lot of fun. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> guys welcome to the show thank you so much for coming on thanks for having us man yeah, thanks for man. having us so right off the bat so people are aware we're talking about a ghost waits mm-hmm. and it's an awesome film I, I love indie stuff and you guys did a great job if people are interested in watching this you can go to arrow-player.com sign up $7.99 a month you get that first month free and then you can yeah. sit there and watch mcleod it's actually four ninety nine a month, oh four ninety nine, uh, or forty nine ninety nine a year. And Even then, if better. you use the code Air, all caps Arrow UK launch, you get half off your first three months. I I couldn't say it any better. So there you go. This guys is go. my this is my job. <laughs> this is what I do now. you. I think I say it in my sleep at this point, actually. <laughs> <laughs> a ghost waits. It's been out for about a month, I think, mm-hmm. on Arrow. How's it? Do- how's it doing? How excited! It's the are number you one to- film on Arrow. What's that? It's the number one film on Arrow. That's awesome. And they have Congrats. more than one film, so uh, yeah, it's inc- <laughs> it's kind of incredible. Yeah, and they also have good films. So. They do. Yeah, they have, they have a good they have a good library, especially if yeah. you're a horror fan. They have a great library. 
Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, I haven't seen a streaming service quite like it because it's it's curated. It's like heavily yeah. like somebody there's a team putting a lot of thought into the films they want to put forward and how they want to present them and developing extra features and so it's it's not kind of a mindless shovel full of content that you have to pick your way through. There's sort right. of a, a little bit more of a guided journey, which is pretty cool. I've I've not seen that. So, so tell us where did a ghost awaits. Where did this idea form? When did it start? And uh, who came up with the idea first? Well, it's based on a true story. Nice. I, so McLeod and I had spent a year trying to make another movie. And we got pretty close. Like, we were yeah. doing location scouts and had, like, a really good table read. And, and it just we just couldn't raise the money. And I took it kind of hard. And went back to Northern Kentucky, which is where I'm from. And while I was back there, kind of trying to figure out what I was going to do next. Back to your My route. friends. Sorry? Back to the roots. My friends Brian and Jen Price invited me over. I'm not a big video game person, yeah. uh, but they had this game they really wanted me to play called PT, which is a haunted house first person puzzle game. And I played that and I had them cracking up laughing because it was me reacting to a haunted house. So like creepy lighting and a baby cries from an empty sink. And I was just like, nope, don't. I don't need to check any of that out. I'm fine where I am. Yeah. This is the most boring game watching I've ever seen. It's just not doing anything. It's just standing I'm on Twitch. There was like I have <laughs> I have recently learned the term walking simulator. And I was like, yeah. honestly, that might be what I need to play. It's just like <laughs> stuff where I can explore a world, but there's nothing demanded of me. So but yeah, I had them like cracking up laughing. And at some point I was like, you know, I've never seen a, a haunted house movie. With a character like me at this, the core of it, that's just like, no, I reject your entire premise. And then, so I was thinking about that. And then around the same time, I saw this web comic called Saturday Morning Breakfast Cereal. Guy asks this girl what, what she thinks is the most American movie, and he says, or she says, Ghostbusters, because yeah. here's a movie. Here you have demonstrable proof of an afterlife, and the whole thing is about growing a small business and navigating government bureaucracy. <laughs> and I thought that's hilarious, but also yeah. like, oh my god, you're right. If there's a ghost, that means there's an afterlife. I would have so many questions, and that kind of formed the spine. That's I, I sent him. I I sent McLeod a message, just like I think I have an idea for a movie. Oh, that's awesome. And he the also thing that's great about Adam is I feel like I get that message quite often. <laughs> <laughs> my my co-host Johnny gets that way for me with me all the time. I have I want to write this book. I have this total idea. <laughs> It's I, I somebody once said that like my brain must be a graveyard of ideas because it's always yeah. like, oh yeah, I have this thing for and then like a month later, like what happened with that? I'm like, oh, I don't know, nothing. Yeah, I forgot yeah. about it. But yeah, like had that McLeod thought it was thought it was also interesting. Yeah. And then one of the people that we'd met, one of the investors that we had met trying to put together that movie, was really excited to make something. And he was talking to our mutual friend Nick Thurkettle. And said, hey, whatever happened with Adam and the I mean, he's like, oh, you know, couldn't raise the money. But like, he just had this weird haunted house idea. And we got on the phone and the, you know, I, I walked him through it. What I saw, I didn't have a script at the time, but I, what I saw of the story. And he was just like, that sounds good. I'll put in this amount of money. And my I mom just, had said that, you know, uh, if you ever get to a point where you, know, you have a number, let us know if we can help. And so I called her and said, this, I can get this or I have this. Can you match it? Yeah. Because if you can match it, I think I can make a movie. And they... Went and talked to their money guy and came back and said, yeah, we can match it. Oh. And I just started crying. And yeah. then McLeod and I got to work. And I had to write the script. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was it? When you sat down to write that script, did it just flow pretty easy? Or did you outline it out? And then really it just kind of took some time to really – because I always get to a point and it's either I give up or it goes off in a right turn and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. It's weird. like. I don't think I've ever written to the same way. Like sometimes I outline and sometimes I just sit down and then sometimes I'm writing like scene by scene and sending McLeod like a ton of like, <laughs> here's a scene, tell me if it works. But with this one, because we had to move so fast, yeah, I was just like, I mean, I was writing by the seat of my pants. I was, you know, I, I there was a little neighborhood bar about a half mile from my dad's apartment where I was staying. And like, I would walk down there and just write or I'd sit and, you know, in my bedroom and like, and it was... I, I, you know, because I had the, the the structure of a haunted house movie and wanting to explore the idea of an afterlife, it it came pretty easily. 
It's also why we had to do extensive reshoots is because the first act was a mess. Like I'll be completely honest. <laughs> I tend to overwrite. And so, but no, it, it, it's see, I, I don't, I still don't really understand how this worked. I mean, yeah. it's a miracle. This thing <laughs> works and happened and everything else. But yeah. Why, why black and white? You don't see it very often. I thought it, I, I just love pandas, man. On the black and white, <laughs> nothing's washed out. What was that? I'm sorry. <laughs> I said, I just love pandas, man. It's actually one of my favorite da David Mamet quotes or David Mamet lines. Nothing's black and white. Nothing's black and white. Nothing's black and white. What about a fucking panda? So true. So I, I love the black and white aesthetic. Yeah. And so early on, I'd been like, oh, I think I want to make this in black and white. And I, our UPM, Jenny Chen, we were on a location scout. And I told her that. And she was like, no. Yeah. Absolutely not. For good reason. Like we got so many no's from festivals and distributors because of the black and white. But so we shot it in color. We had planned to release it in color, but Mike Potter shot principal photography and he used his camera, which is a 4K Black, black Magic Ursa Mini and mine, which is a digital 16 Black Magic Pocket Cinema. I uh, also, he had like a minimal lighting rig. And yeah. then when we had to go back and do pickups and it was just McLeod and me, and I was shooting, I just had my camera and no lights. It was all natural lighting except for like one scene that yeah. we couldn't use any natural lighting in. And so then like cutting that together and trying to color correct, it never, there wasn't like a visual cohesion like I wanted there to be. Yeah. And then one day McLeod was just like, hey, you thought about making it in black and white? And I was like, you beautiful bastard. I have. <laughs> I have. I love you and, so much. <laughs> yeah. And so I we dropped a black and white uh, LUT on it, which is a color correction algorithm. Yeah. And the moment it was a black and white, what's really cool about filmmaking, especially at this level, is that like technical decisions and creative decisions often sync up. And so like while there's all these technical reasons to do this, the moment we saw it in black and white, especially the moment we saw Muriel in black and white, it was like, oh, this is the movie. Like, yeah. yeah, this this feels right. Yeah. S speaking of Muriel, how did you score Natalie Walker? Because she's awesome. <laughs> she's amazing. <laughs> so uh, Muriel was originally written for a friend of ours who got cast on a TV show and wasn't available. No. So I had got, I'd been following Natalie on Twitter for a long time. She's hilarious and yeah. brilliant. And, and I had that moment of like, oh, she's also an actor, like not just a writer. I should see like if she has any clips. And so I went to her website and she didn't have any clips or anything, and, but her email was on her website. So I emailed yeah. her just like, hey, you know, I'm making a movie in Cincinnati. I don't know if you care about this at all, but like, I, I think you might be right for, a, you know, the lead, the female lead. You know, if you're interested, I can send you the script. And she got back and said, yes, please send her the script. She dug it. She did a self tape. And like the second it starts, it was like, oh, that's Muriel. Like yeah. she just, she just was her. And it's crazy, but like, McLeod and Natalie met on set. <laughs> like they met shooting. He was wow. shooting a dream sequence and she was like 20 feet away in my dad's kitchen doing a makeup test. <laughs> like, cause everybody thinks like, oh, they must've known each other. Like the chemistry is so great. And it's like, yeah. no, no, they just met. That's awesome. The, the first thing Natalie shot was the scene where she sings at the end. Oh, that's hilarious. That's awesome. McLeod, I didn't know you played guitar, dude. I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> for that. Did, who wrote that song? Because that song was actually pretty, that song is good. I like it. I was like, oh, that's a cool song. And I was like, I was wondering if you had to buy the rights for it. But then when you started singing it, I was like, somebody must have wrote it. Somebody must have wrote it for the, the movie itself. Not for the movie. It's actually a band called Wussy. And if you, if you listen to the lyrics, what I play is actually a slowed down version of the song that Jack is listening to when he goes around the house fixing things. Yeah. Um, and no, it was one of, it was a band that Adam grew up listening to and was friends with the, the, the musicians. And so well, it was great. It was a great pick. It fits the scene really, really well. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. yeah McLeod's just like ridiculously talented. Dude, he's like a man of a thousand voices. Have you heard of that? <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> What's funny is like originally, so originally he didn't sing, he didn't sing like that in the, the movie. Originally he was like making up little songs as he worked around the house Yeah, and that never like registered with audiences. Right. Like that's what he was doing. So that was part of the pickups. And so there was originally a different song that was going to play under him working in the house, but I could never get 
the musician to like officially give me the rights. Right. They never, they would just not answer emails. Yeah. And so finally when like, and that's not, that's not a pressing issue when it's kind of like, you know, plug and play and, you know, yeah. But yeah. if he was going to sing the song, I was like, we got to get this thing cleared. So yeah, because I know Wussy, I've known them since before they were a band. I just messaged Mark Messerly like, Hey, can we have yellow cotton dress? And like 20 minutes later we had it. Oh, that's awesome. That <laughs> and, us, and then we, we went and bought McLeod a guitar at a pawn shop, and he spent a couple of days learning the song. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know the chord? Did you know how to play any chords or anything when you started? Yeah, I had I, I play I grew up playing bass and I played oh, okay. bass guitar in bands and stuff, but like about a year, maybe two years before we shot a ghost weights, my now wife, then girlfriend, got me a like, you know, bottom of the line fender acoustic guitar and i yeah. myself that so i could like strum out some some sad slow songs some bruce springsteen some <laughs> hey, Mikhail, can you play i'm on fire for us right now <laughs> <laughs> i cannot are you taking requests <laughs> oh McLeod, I, I i never got a chance to say congratulations on uh, on the birth of your of your uh, your baby Thank you. on she was about ready to to give out was that she was about ready to pop when she when you were on your wife? Oh yeah, yeah, I guess yeah, so. You were like you literally told us, "Hey, there may or may not have to go. You never know because <laughs> we're getting to the zero hour." Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, she turns this this Saturday. She turns one year old. That's crazy. Yeah, and she's uh, she's awesome. Don't she, they just change everything? Yeah, how you look at yeah. everything, how you act about everything. They just change everything. I mean, like to to. To Adam's point about his brain being an idea graveyard, yeah. like I feel like that's 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 a lot of what's happened to me because it's just like you you you're just most of your time is just spent with the kid and yeah. taking care of them, and so you know all while you're sitting there teaching them red, blue, <laughs> orange, green, every other idea that flies through your head of like oh you know it'd be really fun to do oh you know it'd be really fun to do oh you know. <laughs> Back in touch with, oh, like just you just you just ball it up and you say, "Cool, Buddhism, throw it away." <laughs> Is this your first movie that you produced? No, I also produced. Uh, they look like people and the siren. I watched. I, they look like people, and it freaked me out, dude. Oh yeah, yeah, because I was like, I was watching it, and it's really mu very much a one man show. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for you you know and when you go through it and you're just like and you guys never really answer the question is it just him or is it <laughs> is there something else there and it's just like and i'm like the exact opposite of that i'm like i need to know what happened <laughs> oh. <laughs> so i'm like watching you and i'm just like god damn it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was good well, i liked it sorry I, I, to leave you hanging well you know what watching um i gotta turn this ringer off Getting into more, yeah. Of get your shit together. Stuff. Thought you were a professional. I know, right? <laughs> Usually, I'm pretty good about that, but apparently, I just got a brand new phone, so I, uh, uh, okay, I haven't. Nice. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's my excuse. I'm sticking to it. Yeah, <laughs> it's a brand new phone. It's a rotary. Yeah, it's a rotary. <laughs> Zero. No, but after talking to you and the fact that you've been making these smaller films, uh -huh. and putting them out there I, I had to go and i watched they look like humans is it they look like humans uh people people huh? people they look like people sorry and um, I, I i was like oh this is really cool i it opened up a whole different world than just the major blockbusters you know what i mean mm -hmm. like there's a group of people that are putting their heart and soul beyond like i always love movies i love movies period you know and I love B movies and C movies. And I always tell people when they make fun of movies that they see like late night on sci-fi that are not sci-fi funded, you know, and it's just like, you got to understand that person that directed it, probably wrote it, directed it, produced it, and probably maxed out all of their credit cards to get this on screen, you know, <laughs> yeah. and they love it. And, and so I always I had that mentality. And I introduced you to E movies. Yeah. <laughs> And then, so after talking to you, there was like this whole other level of movies that I didn't really realize was happening like this. 
you didn't realize how small it could go. Yeah, it was cool, man. And then it's like sitting down. And then when when you reached out to us about, hey, we're putting this out, you, you know, I was like, oh my God, we got to have you on because I want to watch this. And then it wasn't available anywhere until I saw <laughs> Arrow had just said, hey, we just released it. And I was like, oh, boop, 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 watching. And it was, it was awesome. I just, it was, you guys did a, a fantastic, fantastic job. And I don't know, did you said, Adam, you said you just did an algorithm for the black and whites, but I've seen black and white films where the whites are super washed out, you know, mm. and whatever yeah. you did, it looks fantastic because black and white always has all that detail and it's all there, man. It looks great. We got really lucky. A buddy of mine also made a little no budget black and white horror relationship movie yeah and his his friend had color corrected it and so he just was like hey you should talk to ari and i talked to ari and like sent in the movie and he dug it and, and then i looked at his imdb page and was like there's no way we could afford this guy like he did bone tomahawk there's no way he's a real and he <laughs> he's a real guy like, ah, i like the movie <laughs> like I'll give you a weekend for, you know, a very low rate. Yeah. And so I just went over for two days to his apartment in Brooklyn and watched him color correct the entire movie. And it was like watching a magician work. That's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's, it looks really good. And that is, that is largely because Ari Rothschild is very good at his job. Oh, that is yeah. awesome. The LUT was just sort of to see if it would work, if the choice would work. And then Ari came in and, and made it pretty. Yeah. McLeod, how do you balance shooting a movie, producing a movie, and doing all your narr narration work? Because if people don't know, McLeod is on every book ever pushed out. <laughs> <laughs> every book ever every written. Every single one. <laughs> I narrated it. I have many pseudonyms. <laughs> we are legion. <laughs> but seriously, man, you are a busy man, dude. How do you manage that time? And with the a one year old coming on the on the horizon? You, I mean, yeah, I'm uh, impressed. Well, thanks, thanks. I guess to start at the end and go backwards, the great thing about audiobooks is once you get one on your schedule, you're pretty much locked in, and it's a very big time commitment. But if you have enough advance notice of your of your schedule and things you need to do, you can have a lot of flexibility and block time out. So, so whenever I knew, you know, we'd be shooting or even if I just need, if I knew we would have a big crunch week to, yeah. uh, to, to work on the edit or to get it out to festivals or just when I knew ahead of time that there was a lot of work to be done or if I needed to do work on the sound design, which was many, 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 many hours of work. I, I can block out that time in advance and not record a book then. So that's 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 sort of how I take care of that. With regards to producing and performing, I actually find I find the producing kind of frees me up a little bit. It 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 gives me a really innate sense of purpose of why I'm there. That's yeah. that's beyond just the performance, and that kind of allows me not to fixate. I can be pretty detail oriented, and it. It, it keeps me out of my head a little bit and sometimes it helps me relax into the role and, and just focus on what's necessary for the scene. And also to think of, to approach every scene, uh, you know, as an actor with a kind of holistic view of a producer of like, okay, how does this help the movie? Like, forget about me and, you know, what I do or don't want to do as an actor, what do I got to do? What do I have to accomplish as an actor to tell this story? And so that, you know, allows you to do simple plot-based scenes yeah. with more natural ease because, you know, you, you're not always trying to chew the scenery. And yeah, and so, but sometimes the best thing to do is to just step back. Adam made me do this for one of the big scenes in The Ghost Waits and and be like, this scene is, you know, it was a moment where like, this scene is too important. I need you to not get the crew coffee for a day. <laughs> I need you to, you know, I need you to not be hold lights and to help us move location. <laughs> I, yeah. You know, I need you to just do whatever you have to do to focus and prepare. So yeah, sometimes you just have to take the producer hat off and, and pay attention to the, the acting. But yeah, I, I actually like it. And now, you know, when I, when I act in something where I'm not also producing, 
I have, I, I still have that greater awareness of all the moving pieces that go into making a film and on set. So that also helps me relax into a set where I'm like, ah, yeah, I know why we're waiting. I know what the delay is. I know what that guy over there is doing. I know why this person keeps waving a thing in my face and I'm cool. Which is going to help you interact with the grips. Is it the yeah. grips and everybody <laughs> around you much easier? Keeps me from having a Christian Bale moment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next for you guys? I, I feel like you, we have a little bit of a dynamic duo on our hands. Is this going to be another thing? Or Adam, do you have anything? I know you got something going around in that brain because, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, we don't know. There's a few things that are kind of like potentially happening, but yeah. like nothing's officially happening yet. And I have learned to not to wait until something is real to talk there's because there, there's so many like false starts and close calls like i've already i think like the q a after our world premiere i was like and the, this thing that's gonna be our next thing and it is it is not <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm learning not to talk out of school but yeah we're we're working on there's one thing that's like a time travel road movie with a little bit of uh, disaster movie sprinkled in there's a there's a crime it's a it's a thing that's like based on a true crime that happened in my hometown there's a yeah there's like a bunch of stuff and i'm right now i'm writing the the sci-fi thing mostly we've we've got a draft and uh, it turns out i forgot to put a second act in it so i'm working on that which has been like a lot of fun i I don't remember if I actually messaged McLeod last night or I just thought I did, but I drove myself crazy writing a sequence. He's checking right and, now. Yeah. And like got done and uh, thankfully the NBA season is going. So I, I can just turn that on and unwind <laughs> and I fall asleep by halftime anymore. I feel like I'm getting old, but yeah, we have like, I don't know. We haven't done like a Google doc. Yeah, uh, of, of like all the stuff, but I feel like we have a bunch of things that we kind of want to do. But right now, yeah, like the response to this one has been so great that we're trying to kind of seize whatever momentum we can. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. What happened on this in this movie that might have been a surprise to you, to both of you? Everything. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, because I, I know that sometimes you'll shoot scenes. And you'd be like, oh, that was crap. And I just don't have time to go back. And then you go back through it and you're in the in the editing process and you're like, wow, that worked really, really well and, and totally didn't see it until I'm sitting down here. Do you have that moment or did... Was it all? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's been such a long process. I mean, yeah. there was... Yeah. There are scenes like... There are scenes that, you know, Adam had written in the first draft that that didn't really didn't really work in the cut but then we realized that the the role they played in telling in storytelling was structurally necessary so we sort yeah. of re reintrodu reintroduced it but like in a fresh way I yeah like, I, I feel like when i started like cutting it together the assembly cut was bad it was an hour and 50 minutes which now the movie is 79 minutes. So yeah, like, what's the assembly cut? What is, what is that? So the assembly cut is the very first thing, where, the very first cut where you put all of it together for the first time. Okay. Just And all it is is just like scene, 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 scene. You're not really fine-tuning it. You shoot yet. everything out of order. The assembly cut yeah. is you putting everything into order of what you want. Yes. Got it. Yeah. And, you know, we had shot this in... We shot it over 12 days. Principal photography was 12 days in August 2016. Yeah. And we shot during a heat wave in a house with no air conditioning. It was less than ideal. And then we, we wrapped. McLeod went home to LA. I slept for a week. <laughs> and then two weeks after we wrapped, I went out with my girlfriend for our first like date night and yeah. she broke up with me oh. and and then i was just like oh, out of commission for like a month right of just there was like a month of feeling nothing and then a month of feeling sad and angry constantly and then you and i remember like talking to mcleod and evan uh evan dumichel who, who's also named look like people and evan being like you might want to hire an editor because like you need to do that like it needs to be edited right. and i was like i will get to it evan i am going through something <laughs> 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 and so once I finally did like sit down and start editing it together, 
you know, Steven Spielberg tells the story of like showing the assembly cut of Close Encounters, and by the time it's done, he's like on the floor hiding. Right. And George Lucas just comes over and puts his hand on his back and is like, buddy, if you make a good assembly cut, you've made a bad movie, which doesn't make sense, but is a very nice thing for a friend to say. Right. <laughs> and so we, you know, it was bad, except that the ending always worked. Once that song kicks in, yeah. years go by by the Bengsons, it, like everyone who watched it was like, okay, that's something. And so it then became like, okay, let's tighten it up. Let's, let's get to the ending faster. Right. And, you know, I spent a few months doing that. And then eventually it got to the point from like, where like from minute 34 on, we were solid. Yeah. But the first 33 didn't quite get us there. And that was when we started doing the pickups and like reimagining, you know, the first act and everything. So, and that, I want to say it was the first set of pickups, which led to probably the most surprising moment for me. The toilet scene <laughs> is... That was in the script, except that it was just the phone conversation with a bunch of lead up that was really shitty exposition, di or really shitty dialogue. And I had cut it because I was like, there's no way I'm going to let the people know that I'm that bad a writer. <laughs> and McLeod comes back like, you know, buddy, I, I think we actually need that. Like, it, it, we need it. We need the information that it gives us. And I was like, well, then we're going to have to reshoot it because I am not letting people know I'm that bad a writer. And all it really was was like, lopping off the first half yeah and you know now it comes in with like that works thanks there was a whole conversation before that and yeah. it was stupid so you know and then we were we were doing that scene a few times and finally like mcleod was just like i have an idea and he started making the toilet talk and i ruined the take laughing <laughs> and like i think i even did it again at some point i had to just walk away i was like you got this i'm gonna go because i can't not laugh at this it's amazing well, at least you're not having to shoot onto film you know what i'm saying right 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah oh god that would be irresponsible but yeah like and then so it's it, it's not that it was surprising but like you know the 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 ending sequence with the song and then the scene before it where Jack tells Muriel that he has feelings and they have their kind of emotional catharsis conversation. Like, that was my favorite scene to write. And once I, like, fine-tuned it, like, that was kind of the first one that I was like, this is my baby. I'm gonna, you know, that way I can, like, show people a scene. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. like, when that clicked into place, I was just like, Okay, I'm doing. I got some, we got something going here. Like, yeah, I might not suck at this. That's nice to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely I mean, don't suck at it, man. You get you guys did a wonderful job. You really did. I'm thank not you. just telling you that you re, you guys really did a wonderful job. I can't wait to make people watch it. No, no, no. You have to watch this. <laughs> <laughs> what? How it's did like, you it's gonna it? be like a Saw movie. It's like the saddest Saw movie. It's like <laughs> you have to watch a Ghost Waits or reckon with your life in order to get out of it. I'm just gonna, well, what you haven't seen a supernatural dramedy before? Come on, <laughs> want to play a game? <laughs> <laughs> want to play a game? Exactly. How did you guys find each other? Through How did this friendship, buddy? Craigslist misconnections. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you in a crowded restaurant. <laughs> oh no, we uh, we uh, both worked on this film next to me. It's a show. podcast, McLeod. You have to say what it was. Yeah, but th that's what I thought last <laughs> I time we did a press I can see it. And then I and then all of a sudden everybody's releasing <laughs> videos, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize I had to look okay. Uh oh. <laughs> we do both, man. We'll do the audio. We'll do it just for you. <laughs> I'll just put a picture. First, yeah, we we met on a movie called Split. It's a bowling romantic comedy that was shot in Louisville, Kentucky. A McLeod bowl? acted in it, and I was the second AD. And we did, in fact, see each other from across a crowded karaoke bar. <laughs> and I was like, "Hey, hey, <laughs> would you get was it instantly like, hey, let's we're working together, we get along." And you're like, "Hey, McLeod, I got all these ideas. I want to run by you." Is it that's scary accurate? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Yeah. It's like, hey, like while we're while we have a weekend off or something from the film shoot like i want to i want to do a script reading of a script that i wrote and he asked me to be part of that and did you do all the voices i did every single one i did you not know i'm everyone yeah i love it yeah <laughs> you or me you're just <laughs> the clouds every woman <laughs> 
but I could see you writing, reading a script and doing a couple of voices. <laughs> just this for the table read, just, just for the two of you. You know what I'm saying? No. It was it was actually funny. It's the first time. I think it's the only time this has ever happened so far. Yeah. I like I. I was like, oh, that guy's really interesting and really good. Like, which I asked him, like, hey, would you mind if I sent you a script to read? And he had some days off while we were shooting. So he had gone to Michigan to record a book. Nice. And he had downtime and he was sitting in his hotel room. So I sent him the script. And then two hours later, I get a response from him that he was like, this is great. And I was like, oh, nice. How have you already, like, are you okay? <laughs> like I'm in a Do holiday in something? Michigan, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I got. This is the do. best thing happening for me right now. <laughs> but how did the t- the first table read go? How do- how does that work? Does like like I'm uh, be- of a ghost. Totally honest, not messing around. Like, does do do you guys each do different characters, or did you have a bunch okay. of people in the room to read the different parts? So. McLeod is conflating a couple of things. And I, <laughs> it, it, since you want to get into it a little bit, I had sent him a script that I'd written called Dumpster Baby. Okay. And, and we've actually never done a script read of that. Really? Um, yeah. We've never done a script read of Dumpster Baby. What we did, did we a script do? read of There's Nothing Outside. Well, I know that one. The, but the we did one two of that. them. Did because we, one- we did the first one at Janie Weatherup's apartment. And that was the one that, like, Becca Pruitt and Sarah... In Kentucky? At the, like, at no. the split house? No. Oh, that was an actual split script read. Oh. Uh, yeah. Because uh, that was in that, like, that front, that living room that Josh took over as a bedroom. I don't know where I've been, guys. I'm every... <laughs> so, you know, it's all the same. Uh, <laughs> I feel like to your... <laughs> but so, like, to, to answer your question, like... So we did two script reads of this movie, of another script called There's Nothing Outside. Yeah. The first one, my my buddy Nick and I had had this, like, we called it Living Room Master Thespians. It was a group that would get together to do script reads, and, and we, did, we did that. And then that kind of showed us what didn't work in the script, and McLeod and I stayed up until, like, 1.30 in the morning fixing the ending. And then I spent, like, 10 months casting another table read, and that was the one that, like... We did in the conference room of this production company in Sun Valley, and it went really well. And that was the one that, like, Lucy was part of and, like, Christina Klebe, all these people, really wonderful. And so, like, if you want to know, like, how you put together one, like, you can either do it very informally where it's just to kind of hear the script on its legs and get a sense of what works and what doesn't. And I've done that a few times. With, with different things. But then the second one was a much more like, no, this is the crew that we could roll with and like make the movie right now. And cool. sadly that didn't happen. But like, that's where I learned a lot of like how to cast because like I have a lot of actor friends and all of them will tell you about the special hell that is auditioning. Yeah. So, and what I started noticing was like, all you really, like all they really want is for you to respect their time. Yeah. You know, it's like with auditions, you go in and you're in a room with a bunch of people who look vaguely like you and your car is sitting outside and you either got to run out and, you know, refill the meter or you get a ticket, like, because you never know when you're going to get called in. And it was just like, oh, the bar is so low for like getting people to feel good about a project. Yeah. So what I would do is I would send people the script and say, like, just tell me what you think. Just tell me, like, I'm not even going to tell you what character to focus on. Just, like, yeah. let me know if one's, one jumps out to you. And that what I kind of learned by doing that mm-hmm. is that the thing with casting is that you're looking for 100% right. And 99% right is really good and really close. And discipline can get there, can get you there, and craft can get you there. But 100% right is instinct. Right. And the way to find that, I have found, is... Just talk to them about the story mm-hmm. and see kind of where they gravitate towards. You know, and even you can kind of carry it further when yeah. you're actually making something. Like the cool thing with McLeod, with like with working with like my best friend, is we're very reactive. You know, if if one of us kind of sparks to something, even if it's not what the other one had in mind, it's like, okay, well, let's let's explore. Let's find out what this is. Yeah. You know, we're never we're not afraid. I'm not precious about the script, and he's not precious about performance uh, so, or, or ideas. So that's so rare too, man. It's hard to get that. And when you find that with somebody, ooh, that's awesome. 
oh yeah, I never want to make a movie without him. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, guys, I so much appreciate you coming on. This was amazing. I, I can't. I have to implore. Oh, we're not going to do a two-hour episode this time. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to do a two-hour episode? <laughs> I mean, I, I thought we were going to get into comics at some point. I, oh, are you are you a big comic fan? I told McLeod, I was like, oh, man, we're going to talk about sex criminals. This is going to be amazing. <laughs> yeah, Matt Fraction and uh, Chip Zdarsky. Yep, we had Chip